Welcome to another edition of A Voice to the Gentile Church. I'm Jim Wingerter. Next to me is Pastor Roger Diaz. Next to him is Dolores Lowe. So Dolores, the Pope had a rant this morning. Oh my gosh. <laughs> he wants the war to end now. Yes. And he thinks he can, I guess this is the way he... He, he thinks he can will that into yes, being. Yes, just by saying it, right? Yeah. And, and the problem is, you know, this Pope uses ambiguity like a weapon. Like today he'll say something, tomorrow he'll contradict it, the following day he'll contradict it again. And it just makes people so confused that no matter what craziness he it's says. It's an old Sith trick. Yes, it is. Yeah. It is. No. So. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe he is a Sith after all. <laughs> starting to think so. And we're so. all Jedis. <laughs> So yeah, so he made his annual address to the diplomats at the Vatican and basically pounded his, be his fist, calling for an end to the war. That guy. So, you know, not that this pope has been the most friendly to the Jewish nation, right? Of course not. Yeah. And and historically, none of them have really been. Yeah. Some have been a little. Yeah. Right. When but, you when you consider who he is, I mean, he's the first Jesuit pope. Yep. The Jesuits, they have, a, they have a, a track record with the people of Israel, with the Jewish nation. Yeah. Uh, why am I not surprised? <laughs> right. So to make matters worse, you remember, I think it was like two shows ago, we covered the changes in the Catholic Church, right? Where um, they aren't exactly blessing same-sex marriage, but they are blessing same-sex right. marriage, yes. right? That, that was the That's thing. the ambiguity thing, yes, right? Yes, that right. the Pope polls, right? And it manifests itself like for example yesterday chris christie not that it matters because it is chris christie and nobody listens to him but chris christie used that proclamation from the pope to change his position on same-sex marriage up until then he was against same-sex marriage but now that the pope blessed it he says he's for same-sex marriage right so all of this shame on you chris christie <laughs> Shame on you. And he wants to be elected. Yes, he yeah. wants to be elected. He thinks he's a viable yeah. candidate. Let's face mm. it. The only reason he's running is because there's money, right? Mm -hmm. When you run for con for an office, you make money. That's what it is, right? He's running for money. So anyway, um, if you recall, the office that made that proclamation on behalf of the Pope is called the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith. Which used to be the Office of the Inquisition. You got it. So those lovely people. It's a Jesuit, Jesuit Dominican uh, order. Yes. So they went from a title of ambiguity to a title of greater ambiguity. Yes, just to make it great for us, right? Yeah. So the bishop in, char in charge of that office is Victor Manuel Fernandez. He is in charge of that office because he's an old friend of the Pope. He's also from Argentina, just like the Pope, right? And... It came out today that in 1998, this bish, bishop wrote a couple of books. <laughs> you, you almost slipped up slipped there. Slipped up time. <laughs> um, was, that, <laughs> was that a Freudian slip? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so one book is called The Mystical Passion, Spirituality and Sensuality. And the other book is called Heal me with your mouth, the art of kissing. Okay? What? Yeah. These books are basically blasphemous. <laughs> right? And if you see this this bishop, he's some skinny old guy, right? Um, Makes it even more interesting. <laughs> yes. Um, so in the art of... Shouldn't no, the laugh. mystical passion... Shouldn't laugh at this stuff. <laughs> I know. Yeah, no, right? it's, but it's just so, <sighs> so beyond, right? In, in, in the mystical passion... He actually has a chapter that deals with this girl who was having a, quote, vision of having sex with Jesus, right? Oh my God. So blasphemous right uh, there, right? And in the, oh. I'm not even going to go into the stuff that's in the heal me with your mouth. You can, you can just imagine yeah. that, right? So not only are they going this wacko, <laughs> we're going to change it to church doctrine, <laughs> This is a man who is in charge of defending God the Catholic mercy. faith. This is a man who ghostwrites most of what the Pope puts out. Do you know his name? Yeah. Victor Manuel Fernandez. Oh, same, same yeah. guy. Yeah. This is that man. 
and this is what well, you, there's a spiral happening in the mm -hmm. Vatican uh, there's a huge upheaval in the Roman Catholic world you know we talked about the prophet of the 13th century Irish prophet by the name of Malachi and I don't know maybe he was Jewish I don't know Malachi and he, he numbered this Pope I think it's number 40 something 46 or something and he said that this would be the last Pope yep and that following this Pope the the, the 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 Roman Catholic world will be completely changed it wouldn't exist the way it did before so I mean you can see it right yep I mean they're working towards it well the biggest problem is the Catholics in Africa right because the Catholics in Africa are really conservative they're much more conservative that's and right they have stated that they will not go with this kind of stuff so where all the money is coming out of Western Europe right which is totally liberal and is super happy for this. All the members, the only place where Catholicism is growing is in Africa. Right. So I feel for, you know, the African Catholics who are having to deal with this nonsense, right? Well, but that placates yeah. into what he wants to do, cosmic upheaval within the church. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, Africa, the entire continent, has been dismissed by mm -hmm. Christianity, not just you know, Roman Catholicism, but much of Christianity has turned their back on Africa. And you're about to talk about something that's very relevant to that. It used to be that Protestant Christianity was very interested in Africa. And they would send just just yeah. just scores of missionary groups into Africa. That has changed and that has changed primarily because it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. Islam is like a plague. It just it just it's just devouring the entire continent. So yes. you, you do have something that we can talk about in that yeah. regard. So the United States government has an office, the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, right? Or USCIRF, because we love our acronyms. That office puts out an annual list called the Religious Freedom List, right? And it's, it's actually a list that lists com countries that are um, adversarial towards religious freedom, right? This wonderful administration decided that Nigeria needed to come off the list. Now, everyone that remembers what's going on in Nigeria right now, Christians are being slaughtered by the thousands. No, listen, I think I think we can say it's not happening now. True. Because it's been happening since 1994. As far as I can re recollect, around the middle 1990s, there began to be civil unrest you know, mm -hmm. sectarian violence in Africa. But it wasn't. It was Muslims sacking Christian communities, yes. particularly there. So they might be correct. There's no more. Yeah. So because they're all dead. They're all dead. Because the Christian communities have all been either killed or subjugated into conversion to Islam. Yeah. yeah. I mean, as recently as it's Christmas Day, there was a church in Nigeria that they came in and slaughtered everybody. Yeah, it's been going on, and, and you know what? The media is so blacked out on it. They're not. They are not putting the emphasis on it. Ever since, listen, I remember somewhere at the beginning of the 2000s, a Christian community, I think it's very much in, in Angola, mm -hmm. uh, stood up and defended themselves. And you know what they did in the media? Christians are attacking Muslims. But prior to that, it's sectarian violence. Don't worry about it. Just what they do, yep. when in fact it was Mus uh, Muslims slaughtering Christians, that just that just burns me badly. Yep. Yeah. It mean it tells me that they don't care about the African continent. Why? Because they're black. Is that what it is? The entire continent is is is, is African, and so we don't really care about what's happening there. The people are being slaughtered, and we can just report whatever we want. Yep. Well, you know, the West has a big history of exploiting Africa, right? As well, we've been doing it for a long time. 2000, I was just in Senegal last year, and they had just gotten back their natural resources from the French. Mm, yeah. Because the French had control of everything, and were taking everything and taking all the money. So. There's a history there that's really, really fascinating. Um, the Portuguese began the slave trade. Uh, well, not 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 the historic slave trade. The historic slave trade goes all the way back to the to Muslims, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. They, and 
but the Portuguese were the ones who really began the process of transporting slaves to work in the cane field, the sugar cane productions in Brazil, the Caribbean, and they were mostly Jews. Now the history doesn't tell us that those Portuguese who began that process were very kind to their, to their workers. They almost treated them like indentured laborers. What happened was following that, the British got involved and the Dutch, and then slave, slavery became what it became, mm -hmm. where people were being horribly, horribly suppressed and oppressed. But the, root, the roots of slavery goes right back to Africa, where African tribes were selling other tribes into slavery. Um, again, if you look in history, you look carefully, the Portuguese that began that process of bringing them over to the New World to work the sugarcane industry were not like the Dutch and the English and ultimately the Americans in the South. Mm -hmm. They were kind and they were thoughtful and careful, but that just went awry. So slavery is very much alive today. People are not aware yep. of this. People are not aware of this. In fact, the street that I live on, there's a, there's a Muslim family, and he's got two slaves from Indonesia. Mm. When I say slaves, they are really subservient to him, and they probably work for very little or anything at all. And in a sense, that's slavery because, or indentured labor, indentured laborhood. But yeah, it's it's it's, it's striking mm -hmm. how uh, how how we've treated Africa over the millennia, particularly since the 1990s. It always aggravates me so horribly. Because they're Christians and they're Africans, we can just not even consider them. Right. That is exactly how it, it's being. And you think the Vatican has something to do with that? You think the Jesuits have so, something to do with that? Oh, absolutely. So when I was in Senegal, I visited, I can't remember the name of the island right now, but it was the island where all the slaves were taken to right before being shipped mm -hmm. to the New World, right? On that island is a very beautiful Catholic church. And you would think that they would have intervened because... Are you kidding me? Yeah, I mean, the stories are horrendous, right? They're, they're just... At, it breaks your heart when you're there and you see it. And there's this one door, and it's the door through which every slave went through, and it was the last time that they, they were on the ground in their country. Yeah. And I'm sitting there going, there's a church like three blocks from here. And they allowed this to happen and didn't care. Well, the church was Actually complicit. encouraged it, right? It was being complicit in the whole thing. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So from that kind of news to really depressing news, right? I, I don't know. I don't even know how to, how to put this. So we all know about Epstein, right? Jeffrey Epstein and his whole pedophile island and his Lolita mm. Express. And... There is a lawsuit between Virginia Guffrey, who is one of the girls that was... Right. Um, ex Saw the doc, yeah. Right. I know who she is. Yeah, and Ghislaine Maxwell. Yes. Epstein's girlfriend, madam, you name it. And this was all in court, and, un and all the data was hidden. It was all sealed. And then two weeks ago, the judge said, we're going to unseal everything. Wow. So now the last document drop happened today. And it's been drop after drop after drop. And it's every big name you can think of in um, politics, business, you name it. You know, from Bill Clinton to Al Gore to Menendez to Menendez's girlfriend Beck. And curiously enough, not Trump. Mm -hmm. So the left's losing their minds, right? Because they were sure that they were going to have it. But it's. It's, and of course, the number one visitor to the pedophile island was Bill Clinton. He had the most. Trips I don't think anyone. that surprises anyone. Yeah. And of course, Prince Andrew, right? And right. the interesting thing <laughs> is, I believe that in today's drop, there is video. Okay. Mm. So it's going to get really interesting now. So, what about that huge portrait of Bill Clinton in the red dress? Mm -hmm. Is that being talked about? Not anymore because yeah. everything else is so big now. It's all hitting. So tell us about that one didact didacted uh, name. So in the list of 170 names, there is one name 
that is redacted. So it's black, right? I can't remember what number it is, but it falls in the B's right before Bjorn, B-J-O-R-N. So it's G. Yeah. yeah. And the internet, of course, is going crazy claiming that it's Biden, right? It hasn't been proven no. yet. No. <laughs> but, you know, it, it does fit because it's an alphabetical list and it's the B right before Bjorn, so you gotta know that it's gotta be, you know. By. By. B, by. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <sighs> so we will see further developments as, they, as um, people dig through all the data that's being released. But it's absolutely, you know, you have little respect for politicians. In so general, it goes right? by it goes by the last name, not yeah, the first by name. Last, last name. name. So B I. Last name, comma first name. B-I, right. So somebody took an indelible marker to it. Well, Did that's that. how you redact, yeah. right? You 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 color it black so it can't be seen, right? Oh, so the but, judge's intent was that it would be public, whoever, right. whatever this information was, and then it's not all completely right. public. So we'll see what happens, right? Who redacted it? Right. Another and question why? in that regard is, who killed Epstein? Right. Yep. Epstein said quite clearly and articulately that he has no plans to self-murder and that if if it happens, he didn't do it. Right. He said that before mm-hmm. it did. happened. Yep. So, so it'll be interesting as... as more develops as people get to dig through everything, video gets looked at, all that kind of stuff. It'll be interesting. We are an ill oh, nation. Yes. We are an ill nation. Mm. And when judgment And comes, we're so ill that we're we're more than more than than ready to allow this president to go another four years when the guy is an absolute vegetable. Mm-hmm. It's like, what has happened to us? Where, where has our pragmatism, our logic, our common sense, where, have it, where has it disappeared to? Every day I say, why are, why are these two candidates all we have to choose from? <laughs> and I, we look at the people that are running on the Republican ticket, and, and they have a small percentage. Right. And Trump My carries mother. the ball on that thing, and... and uh, why are so many people so infatuated with him? Why is he the so, only alternative in their minds? So this is partially created by the Democrats, right? Because they have been yeah. pounding him so hard yeah. for so long that people are feeling sorry for him. They're like... Well, it's not just that they feel sorry. They're saying, well, we're going to teach you a right, lesson. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So there, this is the, this is the, and, and I, th- I think he's better than Joe, but I don't think he's a lot better. Right. And I'd like to see somebody else rise up who's a real but, leader. But the Democrats want him to be the nominee. They do. You have to understand Because he's right? the one to beat. Right. So. So Joe said a couple of weeks ago that if Trump wasn't running, he probably wouldn't be either. Right. Because right. he has, right. he has to be defeated. Right. And he, you know, you can count on one thing with Mr. Biden. He mm-hmm. will speak the truth from time to time. Yeah. It'll slip now, right out. <laughs> now, I will tell you that people had been saying Michelle Obama's going to run, Michelle Obama's going to run, and I was like, ah, why would you bother? But just yesterday, she came out and said that she was terrified of Trump winning the election and yeah. that she couldn't sleep. To me, that's her first signal that, hmm, yeah. I'm going to jump into this. So because you might have a you might have a uh, uh, Michelle Obama and Newsom uh run right ticket and it's probably i won't be surprised if it's an october surprise right absolutely have the entire the entire planet planet mortified of the pros, prospect of biden running against trump right up to october and then suddenly make the switch yeah. i mean you remember when the democrats took office they said oh the adults are now in charge right and yeah. look at what's happened in the world since they came along wow. And even Biden's staff doesn't respect him. Our Secretary of Defense was totally incommunicado. He was at the hospital. Surgery. Nobody could reach him. And nobody knew about it because he didn't tell anybody. That's totally against the rules. 
Congress has to know the second a high-level position is vacant for any reason. Yeah, it's amazing. Amazing. <laughs> okay, so for some good news, because the world is just terrible. Okay, there's a retiree. Is that how you say it? Okay, this guy that was re that you is retired. You know better than we do. <laughs> <laughs> Rodney Holbrook. He's 75 years old, and he has a shed. He lives in England, and he has a shed where he he you know does his little projects and things like that, right? Okay. And he noticed that things in the shed were moving around. For the better, by the way. Okay. Orderly. So he started wondering, tidying up is how he said, that his shed was being tidied up. So he started wondering, and he decided to put up a camera. And he caught some gorgeous video of a little mouse who takes, goes to the table. There's a box in the middle of the table. He goes to the table, and he starts grabbing stuff, paper clips, pens, things, puts them in the box, and tidies up the place. For two months, this, this mouse has been doing that. And it really is tidying. He, he literally grabs everything and puts it in the box. Mm. So, I mean, it's a very cute video. Nothing that a mouse trap wouldn't take care of. <laughs> well, he's very happy with his mouse. Oh. He said he stopped putting stuff away now because the mouse is doing it. <laughs> if, I had, <laughs> if I had a rodent relocating my stuff, yeah. <laughs> I would certainly it's set a trap It's kind of questionable. <laughs> Over the years, I've snapped a few traps. <laughs> oh, so well, that's anyway. interesting. Yep. <laughs> Animals are beginning to show more intelligence than humans. Yep. It's a strange isn't, thing. It's, isn't it's, that a sad commentary? Yeah, it's, 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 really, it's really kind of phenomenal what's happening with animals. Yes. Some really interesting things are happening. Mm -hmm. So we have a good question, and I'll just jump in and read it. Could you discuss the whole narrative about the Eastern Gate? in Jerusalem and the coming of the Messiah. Also, could you provide references as well? Okay. All right, so we'll, we'll address this question. It's a good question. I don't, I don't think we've ever really directly I guess not. treated this in the past. Thinking about the... We've just brushed over it. Yeah. Whenever we talked about the glory of God and the coming of the Messiah, we would touch on it. But this is the more direct question. So it was built by the... Umayyad caliphs back in the seventh century. Uh, in fact, the Umayyad, the Umayyadi movement was the very first Islamic movement to begin to to span out and to to take dominance of the entire Middle East. So the Umayyadis were the ones who really uh, began the process of building up the walls around Jerusalem, followed by the Mamluks. The Mamluks had a lot to do with it as well. And then ultimately the Ottoman Empire. It was the, Mam the Mamluks who decided that that gate had to be shut. And then the Ottomans came along and said, well, we must reinforce it and also put a cemetery in front of it. So the original gate that was built by Solomon, there was a gate. So the gate that's there is not the, the gate that was right. built right. by and Solomon. I hate that because yeah. when you go over there, you want to figure out where things were, and the gate's not in the right place. Well, they believe, as far as the archaeological evidence is concerned, that it's below there. Okay. Somewhere, maybe not directly below there, right. the, the gate that's there now, but, but that's where the gate was. Of course, you know, the Romans, under Hadrian, uh, bulldozed the, the entire Temple Mount. Because Hadrian wanted to do three things to ensure that Israel will never be a, a nation again. And the three things he did was he literally bulldozed the Temple Mount, removed all of the important stones and artifacts. Secondly, he, he began to erase Jewish genealogy, and then, of course, he, he named the land uh, Ilya Palestina, right? right? Called the land Palestine. Those are the three things he did, but one of the things he did, the first thing he did was just completely clear off the Temple Mount. So they don't know for sure that that's where the gate is. But it's it's under there somewhere. Right. So that gate... It's close proximity because it's directly across the from mm -hmm. the Mount of yeah. Olives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the gate that's there now, again, was built by the, the, by the, by the early Muslim uh, caliphate, the Umayyadi caliphate. It, it served for a while, not a very long time anyway, because 
following the Umayyadis, the Mamluk said, this is where the Messiah is going to come into the temple from. And so they, they blocked it up. And the Ottomans also reinforced it again. And they did what they did. That gate during biblical times was known as the Shushan Gate. Why the Shushan Gate? Because it was the gate that faced the east. And the idea was that it was facing the, the Medo-Persian, the Babylonian dispersion. And that the, the exiles that will come from Babylon will come through the Shushan, of course, is Susa. So it was known as the Shushan Gate, the Golden Gate at one time. Uh, the Gate of Mercy, the Eternal Gate, was also known as the Beautiful Gate. In fact, uh, during the time of Yeshua, uh, the disciples, the gate was there. They built the gate right on the foundation of where it was before the Babylonians. In fact, when, uh, when Ezra and Nehemiah and that Zerubbabel movement rebuilt the temple and the walls, they simply erected the gate in the same spot. So it's the same gate that, that uh, the Babylonians had thrown down. So they just rebuilt the gate. But of course, like I said, the Romans, they, they bulldozed the area, and what's there now was built by the Umadi uh, Caliphate. So during biblical times, the gate, during times of Jesus, it was known as the beautiful gate, or the gate beautiful. And we see that account in Acts chapter 3. Um, in Acts chapter 3, I think we all know the story. Uh, maybe you can read that for us, uh, Jim. Peter and John were going up to the temple, and they were approaching the beautiful gate, or the gate beautiful, and that's the, the gate facing the east. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer, and a certain man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, in order to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. So no doubt that that gate was the most important gate. You had, I think, in biblical times, I think you had, I think you had eight gates in total. Uh, but this was, of course, the most important gate. It led to the temple. So you have an example there of the the gate being referred to as the beautiful gate, the eternal gate, the gate of mercy, the golden gate. So all these names given to the gate is pointing to the eastern gate. Now, the eastern gate, or the gate facing the east, is very prominent in the Bible, and in, in, in the prophets particularly. So, let's begin to look at what the prophets had to say about the gate facing the east. Of course, in Ezekiel chapter 10, 18 and 19, we see that the glory of God that departed from the temple moved in an eastward direction. It moved from the Ark of the Covenant to the door of the temple, to the gate of the temple, and to the gate that pointed to the Mount of Olives. So if you can just read that for us. It's beginning in verse 18, Then mm -hmm. the glory of the Lord departed from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim. When the cherubim departed, they lifted their wings and rose up from the earth in my sight with the wheels beside them. And they stood still at the entrance of the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of the Lord, a God of Israel, hovered over them. So it's the same gate. Right. So that gate would lead to the temple, and so the glory of God with the cherubim that carried the glory of God stood above this gate, and ultimately it went to the Mount of Olives and disappeared. Now Ezekiel also saw the return of God's glory. And it's sort of a reversal of what God had done. God had removed his glory from, from the temple, the Ark of the Covenant, and took it eastward, and on the Mount of Olives, it disappeared. So now, in Ezekiel chapter 43, 1 to 7, we see the return of God's glory. Then he led me to the gate, the gate facing toward the east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was coming from the way of the east, and his voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. And it was like the appearance of the vision which I saw, like the vision which I saw when he came to destroy the city. And the visions were like the vision which I saw by the river Chebar, and I fell on my face, and the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate facing toward the east. And the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled 
the house. Then I heard one speaking to me from the house while a man was standing beside me. And he said to me, son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell among the sons of Israel forever. So this is referring to a literal temple, a physical temple that will be built on that temple mount. It's Ezekiel's temple or what we refer to as the third temple. We know that the second temple did not meet the criteria of the third temple because the third temple was very specific in its construction that, that we, we see illustrated for us in Ezekiel chapter 40 to 43. So there is coming the third temple. It's Ezekiel's temple. It's a temple that the glory of God will return to just as it departed. God intends to bring it back in the same way, but much more powerfully. All right. Now, we know that from the accounts in the New Testament, from the book of Matthew and elsewhere, that Jesus is returning to the Mount of Olives. Apart from, turning from returning to the Mount of Olives, we're going to see here that he's going to a specific place when he returns, and that is in the temple. He's going to take his place in the temple. And so, what happens when Jesus returns? Well, the angel in Acts chapter 1 said to the disciples, this Yeshua that you see ascended will in the same way descend and return. So, what Ezekiel saw was the glory of God descending upon the Mount of Olives and taking its place in the temple. Well, that's the return of the Messiah. What we're going to see here in a few minutes, in the, in the following chapter in Ezekiel, it is referring explicitly to the Prince of Israel, to, to, to the one who will take his place on the throne. So, Jesus departed, and he was glorified when he did. And when he returns, he returns in the glory of God. He himself said it. So what Ezekiel saw was the glory of God that will return with Jesus. And let's read the references where Jesus made it very clear that he's going to return in the glory of God, in the very same glory that Ezekiel saw returning to the Mount of Olives. So again, when Jesus comes, he's coming to the Mount of Olives. And he's coming to do exactly what Ezekiel saw in that vision. He is the glory of God. So in Matthew chapter 16, let's read those verses, Jim. For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels. Right, this, that's, that's good enough. Okay. So Jesus is coming in the glory of God with his messengers, right? Go on, 24 now. Oh, yes, 24:30. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. So he's coming in that glory. Uh, chapter, chapter 25, now verse 31. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. So the glory of God returns to Jerusalem with Jesus. He brings the glory back. As Ezekiel saw the glory departing, he saw it returning, and Jesus, Yeshua, is the one who brings the glory to Jerusalem. So if he does, then so do we. Does that make sense? So yes, he is going right. to, he's going to enter through that gate, and we'll see that here in a few minutes. He will specifically enter through that gate, the eastern gate, and he will take his place on the throne of God, and we will come with him. In fact, his coming is not without us and not without the glory of God. We will resurrect in God's glory. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Paul made it clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that our resurrection will be in the kavod Elohim, the glory of God. All right. So, we are the ones that will go through that gate with him. We will all enter in. Now there's a possibility that Israel will build another gate. Oh, we don't know that. But it's not the same gate that existed during the time of Yeshua. It's not the beautiful gate. It's not the Shushan gate. It's the gate that's there now that's all blocked up with stones. Mm -hmm. All right. So again, the, the, the Umayyadi uh, Caliphate, built that gate. It functioned as a gate for a while, and then the Mamluks and the Ottomans said, no, it can't happen. Uh, we got to block it up because there's this prophecy about 
the Messiah, the, the Jewish Messiah, coming to reign in Jerusalem. And so the, the Ottomans did, went a step further and they said, well, we must bury some, some people there, you know, create a, create, create a cemetery there. And the, the idea was that if, in fact, there would be a cemetery at the, at, the, at, the, at the threshold of the gate, then the Messiah will not enter in. Because the, the Jewish Messiah is supposed to be uh, the epitome of what is kosher. He's clean. Mm -hmm. So he's not going to enter into a cemetery because, right. the, you know, the holy man of Israel will not... Well, Torah says a priest should not right. touch dead flesh. Right. All right. So he doesn't have to touch the ground. <laughs> he right. He not touch the right. ground. So the Muslims had this idea, the, the Ottoman Empire had this idea that if we build a cemetery right here, we will prevent the Messiah from coming. And that cemetery is there today. It is. So they've been burying they've been burying people there for you know four or five hundred years. Yeah. And so yeah. it's not going to stop the Messiah from entering. No. <laughs> um, well, they miss the part where it says that the, anything that touches the altar is made clean by right. the altar. So it, it's it's all right. So it is what it is. They've 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 convinced themselves that that's the way to stop the Messiah to come and let me. Let me assure our listeners that nothing will stop him from coming. <laughs> um, if he has to resurrect dead bodies to make it penetrable, then or make it a place where he can enter, and then that's what he'll do. Nothing will stop him, and it's just sort of a really uh, a backward way of thinking that somehow you put bricks in the gate and you put a cemetery out there, it's going to stop him. Well, look no, at them le reading... Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Reading the Bible. <laughs> so the, the glory of God, the kavod Elohim, is going to fill the church. The bride will return in that glory. That glory is 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 indescribable, right? Paul yeah. Paul provided many verses in First Corinthians fifteen to attempt to describe it. It's 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 the being of God, the Shekinah glory, the indwelling glory of God, the representations that we have in the Old Testament in the Tanakh about the glory of God is incredible. What can stand before it? What can what can resist it? This is the same thing that we would be filled with. Um, the glory of God filled the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, and they took the Ark of the Covenant into battle, and the glory of God went before the people of Israel. And no army could have resisted it, right? So what makes the Muslim think that somehow they can prevent the Messiah and his bride, his messengers, uh, from, from taking that, that position? It's, it's prophesied in the Bible. Nothing will stop it. Right. So let's read about what Zechariah said in regards to the feet of the Messiah that will, land upon, that will, will stand upon the Mount of Olives. And that's in Zechariah chapter 14, 1 to 6. Zechariah chapter 14 is the, the end of the great battle, the great battle of Armageddon. 12 and 13 is about this incredible battle, the conflict and everything that happens, uh, what Zechariah saw anyway. But then 14 is the, the, the end of it, the climax of the entire conflict. So 1 to 6. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided among you. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city will be captured, the houses plundered, the women ravished, and half of the city exiled. But the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Now keep in mind, roughly half of Jerusalem is Muslim. Mm -hmm. Just roughly about half. All right, so half of the city will have to be removed. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley so that half of the mountain will move toward the north and the other half toward the south. And you will flee by the valley of my mountains for the valley of the mountains will reach to Azel. Yes, you will flee just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. 
So this is the glory of God appearing in Jerusalem. Yeshua will come, and he is coming as God himself. We know he's the son of God, but he's coming to reign as God in the earth. And he's coming with the holy ones. He's coming with the church, who is entirely glorified and will set their feet upon the mount. We'll set all, he'll set his feet, but we'll be there upon the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives will split east to west. And the idea is that he's entering, he's entering into the temple. Now, Ezekiel makes it so vivid for us. In Ezekiel chapter 44, 1 to 3, concerning what will happen to that gate. Then he brought me back by the way of the outer gate of the sanctuary, which faces the east, and it was shut. And the Lord said to me, This gate shall be shut, it shall not be opened, and no one shall enter by it, for the Lord God of Israel has entered by it. Therefore it shall be shut. As for the prince, he shall sit in it as prince to eat bread before the Lord. Now, this is referring to what will happen to the gate once he goes through it. Right. That it will be shut because the Messiah, the God of Israel, represented in the Messiah, right. has entered through it and no one will enter. So, it's going to be shut once he blasts it wide open right. and enters through it. So, the, the whole idea of the, you know, the Eastern Gate is a big, big factor in Bible prophecy. Christians love to talk about the Eastern Gate because it's talking about the coming of Messiah, which is incredibly ironic because if you take the, 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 the traditional pre-tribulationist viewpoint, he's not coming, he's right. going, he's taking us yeah. away, <laughs> but yet they have this incredible passion for the fact that he's going to enter through the Eastern Gate, and he will. So if he's entering through the Eastern Gate and he's coming to reign in Jerusalem, yeah. then so are we. And we're not going off to be somewhere in the, in, the, in, in, the, in the galaxy or in the universe, someplace called heaven. We're coming to reign in Jerusalem. And that's according to the Bible. Yeah. I mean, both New Testament and, and Old Testament. So Jerusalem is the centerpiece of what God is preparing to do in the earth today. He's preparing to position himself in his son. God himself in his son reigning on that holy mountain with his church and the church itself will be as God that's you might say that's tough but the glory of God abiding in the Messiah in the Son of God and in the church will be as God to all creation mm -hmm. uh, Isaiah talks about a canopy of God's glory residing over that mountain right you know, Zechariah talks about this in Zechariah chapter 12, that the house of David will be like God. That's what Zechariah said, and we should go take a look at that. Okay. In Zechariah chapter 12, around verse 8 and 9, there's this incredible statement about the house of David, which is in fact the church, and we didn't prepare to validate that statement. <laughs> but I think it's verse 8, eight. right? Mm -hmm. So you, maybe you can, if you... 12, if you, 8? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dolores is there. But one of you guys can read In that. that day the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the one who is feeble among them in that day will be like David, and the house of David will be like God, mm -hmm. like the angel of the Lord before them. So the house of David now is another way of identifying the church. Um, in Acts chapter 15, and you know this well, Jim and Dolores, in Acts chapter 15, the, the church is identified as the fallen tabernacle of David, the house of David that's right. being raised up. So at this time, the house of David would be like God. Why? This is the time when Jesus, Yeshua, comes to fight for Israel. This is, this is the, the, the climax of Armageddon. It's leading to post-Armageddon when the nations will come up to Jerusalem from year to year to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. So the point is, he comes with his bride, who is glorified, and this glory will inhabit Jerusalem, will be the canopy of his glory over Jerusalem, and from there, ministry will go out to all the nations. And this will happen. Now, the, the, purpose, of the, the purpose of the gate is sort of, 
it's, it's, it's important, but it's not really that important. Um, Christians, we like to focus on it because we love the idea of the coming of Messiah Jesus. We love it. But he's going to do a lot more than walk through that gate when he comes. Yes. I mean, when you think about the reality of what he's coming to do, the entrance through that gate is just sort of preliminary. It's, it's, it's important, but it's not, that, it's not that important. The fact that he will reign in Jerusalem over all creation, the law will go forth from Zion, the word of God, to Jerusalem, the nations that are left, as Zechariah said, will make pilgrimages to Jerusalem every year to worship the Lord of hosts and to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. That's incredible. He's coming to put an end to rebellion. He's coming to put an end to the madness that we see in the mm -hmm. political, in geopolitics. He's coming to be the Messiah, and that's powerful. Yes, the gate is there. The Mount of Olives will, will, will split, the valley will split. That's, that's amazing. What, what happens when this valley is split from the, from the Mount of Olives to the gate? What happens? Water comes up. And that water is fresh. It's living water. And it, it makes its way all the way into the Dead Sea. That's immense. That's powerful. Yeah. And the entire Dead Sea comes to life, an allegorical picture of life coming to a dead planet. Right. Why right. did God destroy the cities of the Dead Sea, Sodom and Gomorrah? Because of their debauchery, right? Right, right. Uh, yes. Is the world in some debauchery right now? Oh, yes. uh. And what happened when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah? The entire sea became saline, highly saline, and, and, and it's, it's no life. It's unlivable there. So when Jesus comes and that valley splits east to west, that sweet water, that, 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 that fresh water, that's, by the way, 30 years ago, it was discovered that way below the Temple Mount, Kidron Valley, right. is a massive source, it's an underwater river, massive source of water that flows between the, between the three continents. It flows right below the Kidron Valley. No surprise there. And so when that valley, you know, David craved the water from the cistern in Jerusalem. Yes, right. He craved it. And the point is, the water was special. He, 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 he valued the taste of that water. There is water that's underneath that, that valley, the Kidron Valley, that will come up when Yeshua comes, and it will be the source of life that will flow into the Dead Sea. It's, it's directly tied to the life that Yeshua is bringing to this dead planet. And it's, it's, it's a powerful reality when you really stop and think about it. So the Dead Sea will become a place of life. People will be fishing on the banks of the Dead Sea, maybe even me. Right. I, I don't mind. The Ar Aragut farm will be. Yes. I don't, I don't mind. I don't what mind casting the net. Waterside property. Uh, so <laughs> riverfront. Th this, riverfront. <laughs> this, these are some of the amazing things that will happen when he comes. Yeah, focus on the gate. The gate's important, but there's there are much more powerful things for us to set our eyes on, especially if you're in Christ, quote unquote, a Christian, because you're coming, you're being resurrected, and you're coming with him to 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 minister to humanity, to serve humanity. Uh, to be a priesthood. Why don't, why don't we get all excited about being a priesthood? Mm -hmm. To me, that's really, really in, in incredible. And so there's so much that we have to look forward to, so much that's there for us as believers in regards to the coming of Christ. Yes, we Christians, we're, we're mind-trained to think of going to heaven. And the sad, the sad truth is, yes, heaven is there, but not for a thousand years. We will reign here in this earth for a thousand years before we, quote unquote, go to heaven. Heaven is a new Jerusalem that comes at the end of the 1,000 year reign of Messiah and we, this priesthood in the earth. But I want to tell you, I'm looking forward to the new Jerusalem, heaven, but I'm also looking forward to reigning in the earth for a thousand years. Right, yes. A thousand years of ministry opportunity. Right. I mean, consider that. Mm -hmm. You know, the honor is to serve God, and that's the greatest honor in being a disciple of Jesus. We get to serve him, and we're very limited in how we can do that now, right? Right. Uh, aren't we? We're very, yes. but 
in the millennial kingdom, when, G when Yeshua comes, there will be no limit to our capacity of service. We will serve him with our boundaries. I mean, it's, it's wonderful to, to, to consider the coming of Messiah, but yes, let us consider what comes after the reality of a reign of an awesome king in the earth and redemption. Amen. That's our, that's our program. If this question has raised other questions in your thinking, you are surely welcome to share them with us. The easiest way to do that is to uh, email us at voice at buildupzion.org. Again, that's voice at buildupzion.org. We have a couple of guest speakers coming this month. The first is Sandra Barris, a precious friend of our congregation representing Christian Friends of Israeli Communities, an organization she initiated. Uh, she'll be here January 23rd. That's a Tuesday night at 7.30 p.m. And the following week, we'll be, we'll be meeting with Natalie Zopinski, representative of Rescuers of Without Borders. That's not the group that's here in the United States that's specific to Israel. And she'll be here January 30th, Tuesday night also at 7.30 p.m. Till next week, Shalom. Shalom.